Greetings, everybody. Welcome to episode 169 of The Glow. I was uh, not here last week. I was sick last week, so didn't have the great pleasure of being with you and sharing in this space together. But here I am. Today, in this moment, right here and right now, in an, uh, in an undisclosed location, in the basement of an undisclosed location, really excited to be with my guest who's popping on right now, Allison Sher, author of the book, Millennial's Guide to Changing the World. Welcome, Nathan. Welcome, Catherine. Welcome, Frank. Welcome, Scott. Welcome, Christina. Welcome, everybody. When you're entering, you can share where you're from. This is a global... Uh, this is a global, universal uh, celebration of ourselves and an exploration and inquiry of ourselves. Yes, Allison, I see you. Let me, I'll let you get you on in just a moment. I just want to give a little intro um, for you. Hi, Catherine. Welcome for being here. So anyway, the point I'm saying is if you share where you're from, we kind of get this collective feeling of people. Vancouver, British Columbia, an amazing place, by the way. I haven't been there in like... Um, 18 years or so. Welcome, Annie. Welcome, love. Um, I think it's going to work. Let's see if we can hop on Allison here now. Yes, Nathan's joining us from Asheville. Catherine's joining us from Ontario. So we have a couple Canadians coming on. And, uh, whoops, that's not the right person. Cancel. So I've been delving into um, to Allison's book this morning, and uh, really been enjoying it. Um, it's a delve into the Millennials' Guide to Changing the World, right? So it's the focus is on millennials, but um, there's this kind of a feeling of like being able to see the the movement. Um, there you are. It worked. Yes, you're here. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. You hear me okay? You're yeah, welcome. I hear yeah, you great. Welcome. Great. And you're in Charleston, South Carolina today, right? Yes, I am. Hold on, let's get mm -hmm. the screen the right direction. There's like a, there's like a psychedelic <laughs> thing happening there. That was pretty cool. <laughs> that happens around <laughs> me from time to time. <laughs> so how are things in Charleston? Things are a little gray and uh, and moist, as they are typically very moist here. I actually lived here for a decade, and I went to College of Charleston, and I'm doing a keynote at a conference on social change this weekend, so that's what brings me here. Uh, normally, I'm in Asheville with you. Yes, fantastic. <clears throat> fantastic. You know, what I was seeing with the book is it's like about – millennials and millennials got to change in the world right but it's uh, the way i was feeling it too is it's kind of like a snapshot of where we've been and where we're going right in the collective conscious as a whole and that was that was really i really enjoyed kind of that that um that perception because i think it's really valuable because things are moving and changing so fast and it's like this sense of like the millennials in the book kind of representing the future, the awakening of consciousness in all these different areas, right? So like relationships and sexuality and work and multiculturalism and science and um, on, you know, pol politically. So you have all these different areas where it's like, what's the next level? Where are we going? And such, the book is like kind of goes through all these different areas through your lens. So it's through your personal journey of exploring this to yourself, which I love. So it's like, you're essentially like a, I kind of viewed it as like um, you're like it's like a like a journalism like um, I'm thinking of that one guy. Um, there's a guy Gonzo journalism, right? So Hunter you're just S. Like, Thompson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hunter S. Thompson. So you're just like out there. You're talking to people. You're meeting people. You're kind of sharing what's what's happening. You know what's in the um, what's in the collective consciousness, and then you yourself, uh, essentially a character in the story right? The story, which is a real story, a true story, and how you're learning as you go and how you're learning as you meet different people and interviewing people and 
exploring people. So we'll start with like a gigantic question, which is what do you feel that you've learned in this process of like moving through the book and writing the book and meeting all these people and the experiences that you had? Oh, wow. Well, I'm going to answer that. And I just want to touch upon something that you said. It was like sure. Hunter S. Thompson was such an inspiration for this. When I started my backgrounds in journalism and I was like, I want to write a book, but I wanted to be like this experiential journalism. And I actually like lived in an RV for a year while I was traveling around the country and interviewing all those people. So it was like my own little fear and loathing in, um, in the United States, I guess you mm -hmm. could say, meeting all right. these people. So it's cool that you picked up on that. And it's funny too, because it's totally aligned with the talk that I'm giving, how I'm going to answer the question that you asked, which is, what is the biggest thing I learned? I think I learned first and foremost, all the reasons why you should not try to change the world. Oh, great. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, and, I, and I, I chewed on this question of like, what does it mean to change the world? Why am I so obsessed with this idea? And so much of it was an outpicturing of things that I hadn't learned to fully own inside of myself. And because of those, because I, because I was externalizing a lot of things in my life, um, you know, I'm like, there's this song, I don't know if anyone out there listens to the rap group Atmosphere, but there's a song called Scapegoat. And he talks about how like everything that's wrong with the world and his life is like why he's why he can't be happy. And I think in a lot of our minds, sometimes there's this thing like, well, if I just change all these things in my external environment, then my internal environment will shift. And that's not necessarily untrue. But so I found it so much more effective when I change myself and then the rest of the world kind of reorganizes to that. I have found that that is much more effective way at changing my world and the world, because when I change myself, I am changing the world because the ripple effect of everything I do is completely radically different than it would be coming from a different level of consciousness and yeah, so I, that book took me five years to write because I originally the arrow was so pointed outward and then it had to go inward for me to really write the book that you're reading. And um, luckily, you know, I got a book deal, so it took a really long time to write anyways, doing that whole process. So, so yeah, so, so that's the biggest thing I learned. And then now I'm going about, you know, doing things that I believe uh, and other people might agree with that um, that I think are improving the environment around me and are providing creative solutions to myriad problems that are appearing inside of the system because of And that um, that is because now I know myself enough to know that this is like my work in the world. I'm not doing anybody else's work. I'm not meddling with reality and the uh, certain laws of the universe that God has created that I can't, no matter how hard I try, I cannot uh, probably change them, but I can work with them. And yeah, so that was like the biggest thing I learned was just like, how can you actually be in alignment as you go about, as you go about trying to cr create change in the world that you, th that you think is positive. Yeah. That you, that you believe is going to be positive for yourself and other people. I think that what you're talking about is a really common uh, revelation on the human journey. I, I, I totally relate to it myself. It's like, um, I, there's kind of these different stages, right? So there's a stage of like, for me, of kind of like just being disgusted with like what I saw around me and just like sickened by it and wanting to like wanting revolution and everything, everything sucks. And there's so much, there's such a better way to do things. And so the focus is external. And then like, as you start to try to make the change, um, you start to realize that 
you really can't separate yourself from what you're noticing or what you're what you're encountering like you are a part of everything and i loved the last chapter in your book which i was just delving into before we started about science i want to get into that more but like quantum physics showing us that like what we observe the observe and the observed cannot be separated they're one and the same so you start to realize that that there's, there's inseparability between myself and what i'm observing and it's like oh i have to change myself uh-oh <laughs> I thought it was easy. I could just like try to ch poke, poke the finger at all these other people. It's like, no, I have to change myself. And like, that's kind of what I see like you discovering in your journey is like, and it doesn't mean that there aren't things that can't be changed externally. It just means that the two are inseparable, right? It's like changing yourself is ultimately the best way to change what's outside of you. And then you can also do things, you know, the environment, politics, et cetera, that are, that are working outward, but inward realizing that is like the core of the foundation. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for reflecting that. That's exactly, mm -hmm. that's exactly what I was attempting to express. Or, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you encountered a lot of interesting characters on your on your journey, right? So you're traveling across the country, and you're like you're encountering different people, and you're kind of like dialoguing with them and asking them different um, questions you have that go into the book, right? So who are some of like the people that were the most interesting or like inspired you the most? Yeah, well, it's so funny, right? Because talking about out picturing and externalizing all these different archetypes of these mm -hmm. people, and some of them I identify with and resonate with. And I'm like, yeah, like your philosophy on life is righteous and totally right. Mm -hmm. And then I'll, I, but like one of the exercises for me, because I really wanted to get every single kind of demographic represented in the millennials, that I would have to sit face to face with people. I had a lot of, either like traumatic associations or judgments around the decisions that they were making. Mm -hmm. And uh, this book is about emerging adulthood, which is when you're, you're really in this identity exploration mm -hmm. and you're making some of the biggest commitments in your life that end up shaping uh, a lot of the rest of your young adult life. And, mm -hmm. And it's so funny to see how the different roads that people take and how they choose to navigate, you know, essentially like the same planet, but they're mm -hmm. coming from such different backgrounds and such different conditionings. So, you know, I would sit with like a corporate lawyer who at that point I had like all of these judgments where I'm like, how could you, how could you defend the corporate state? You, like, you horrible traitor to the hippie army, um, like whatever it was. And then Do I the hippies say, have an army. I don't know the hippie <laughs> army of nonviolence <laughs> disturbance. I don't know. I don't know whatever it is. So, so um, yeah. And then you know, I would talk to this one corporate lawyer, and she's like, "Listen." I grew up in the Soviet Union and under communism. Both my parents were doctors. I, we were impoverished, no matter, like, even though my parents were some of the most educated people in the, in the country or in the region, the, yeah. Yeah. So, so she's like, I love capitalism. She's like, you have to understand, like, I, because of that, like, I love this, uh, this model to me is so much more, is so much more high functioning than what I grew up in. And if I'm going to position myself inside of this system in a way, she's like, I'm going to bring home the bacon. And I never want my children to ever feel like they can't afford food, like we can't afford food, that they can't have something that they want. So I would go through all these paradigm shifts in talking to these people and having to withdraw my projections onto them and start to see like, the uh the logic behind what they were doing and i would go in and do oral histories and do a lot of uh background research on the people and it's just it's so everyone how everyone's navigating everything is just it's so perfect i'm not here to tell anyone who they're supposed to be i'm just here to share the stories of people who all have different ways of 
interpreting what's going on inside of this country. And my hope is that by providing all of those perspectives along with my own, that we really do have a portrait of a generation coming of age and what, yeah, like the zeitgeist of the times. So sweet. Yeah. A couple of things, a couple of things stood out to me in what you're sharing. One, there's like this, this, there's this paradox that I think can be hard for people to grasp at a certain point, but, but it is what it is. Right. So I think in your case, like you, as you go on this journey, you're delving more into the spiritual truths. Right. And it's like you start to, there's these two things that are true at the same time I found, which is what you just said is like, actually, oh my gosh, actually, everything is actually perfect. I think everything's actually just fine. It's all just like totally fine. Exactly as it is. There's actually nothing wrong and there's no problem. And at the same time, there's like so many things I want to change and improve and like make better, you know, and that, that those two truths can be like a struggle, like it doesn't make sense until you just start to rest in the fact that they're both true at the same time. Right. They're both true at the same time. So that's one thing. And then the second thing is, which I think is really important right now, like more and more important is talking to different people with different perspectives and different ways of seeing the world. I feel like we're kind of like losing that more and more in America where it's like, you have to choose your team and these are the, these are the, the good people. These are the bad people and we hate them and they hate us. And it's like, it's obviously very divisive and it's creating a lot of, a lot of conflict. And I think that um, what I'm interested in, one of the tensions with this, with this, um, uh, these episodes is I want to talk to different kinds of people like you did. And, and hear from different different perspectives and different ways of, that people are interested in um, creating more beautiful world, right? So the, the big word that comes up for me is integration. It's like what I feel like you're doing as you move through the book and you're moving through these different people is like you're integrating a piece like from each person, you know, and they're all just reflections of you, right? Yeah, totally. And, you know, I would go through, it's like sometimes like shaking my body. I'm like, oh my God, my ego is dissolving or, or shape shifting or something as I start to see myself in them and the separation dissolves. And they're actually like learning about the way that they're, uh, the logic behind their identity and the choices that they're making is actually helping me to become a more well rounded person. And it's also helping me to, not be afraid of other people like and not be afraid of my own belief systems changing rapidly and my own self concepts uh constantly evolving and you know if like talking just politics here if there wasn't like some logic in conservative philosophies like why would so many people why would so many people be so so, so adamant about them, right? And um, and then it helps us kind of move into integration, like you said, but also uh, finding balance inside of the polarity of this realm as well, mm. right? Because there's always going to be that polarity, but it seems like the more polarized we are in any kind of way, there there tends to be some dysfunction present, right? Or conflict. Yeah. And, and uh, the goal ultimately... I believe is more harmony, right? But I can't control what other people do are doing, but I can work to to work with uh uniting the polarities inside my own self. Yeah. Yep. Beautiful. It's it's such an amazing journey because it's like again, it like it it looks like it's an outward journey and it is, but it's an inward journey ultimately, which is also the outward, it's like the out the outer and the inner become one and the same. They're not two separate things. And I think that's a really important message, you know, and a really, really important re revelation that you kind of encounter as you move through your, through your journey. And you went through like several different um, scenes, right? You go through like the hippie scene and the punk scene and like other scenes, right? So like, what, what are these different, tell us about these different like journeys of that, of these phases going through these different communities. So I think like, I don't know. So I think probably some people don't go through this as much as I did, but I'll just be everyone's guinea pig here. Um, 
I'm less like this now than I was when I first started this, but it was like all about this identity, uh, self-exploration and, and looking out on contemporary mainstream society. And like, you're saying, like seeing all these problems with it, like, I don't want to end up like my parents or like, I don't want to ever grow up or having even like resentment towards these concepts of adulthood and, um, the images in our mind or my mind around what it means to be an adult, which is like, you get fat, you get boring, <laughs> you get, um, you know, every day of your life is the same. You all, yeah. all of these things that happen. And then, and then looking out in the world, like if I don't belong to this world, if I don't resonate with this society, like what else is there? Like, who do I belong to? What is my tribe? What is my in group and youth culture, you know, beyond being, a hugely profitable enterprise inside of this country. You know, there's also these counterculture movements that young people really crusade and spearhead, and they've kind of gone through many different iterations throughout the decades. But, you know, there's punks and there's hippies. I'm like, maybe I'm a hippie if I'm not like a mainstream society or no, 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 not the hippies. No, I'm a punk rocker. I'm going to go to the metal show. I'm going to... um put get a bunch of piercings and the, this is my tribe and and it it goes into exactly what you're saying um around this like false individuation around being like oh okay like i'm gonna find my identity by almost like conforming to an identity yeah. group inside of society and i think that while I had a great time at the parties that these people throw, and I still go to them, um, you're like, maybe I'm a burner. I'm burning man. This is it. Right. Now I found it. My new world where I, I'm home, finally. Whatever it is. It's also like individuation is to me now more about like my spirit communing with my higher power. And while I would like to think that there is a potential for some kind of consciousness movement to transpire in the psyches of, of humanity that I'm very unattached to it at this point. And more, more so I'm working with this idea that it's everybody's evolutionary process that they will get to at their own time. And if we can have community inside of that process and people who are interested in those kind of things, uh, that is amazing. And I'm not going to force it down anyone's throat because I think that people awaken as they are, as they are compelled in, internally. And uh, when that, when that call is there, then you can find people there are well peppered around the peppered around the world who uh, have insights on that. So on that path, yeah, but I mean, I think for a while I was really fixated on like finding my tribe, like being against something. Um, and now I just feel so much more at home with everything. And like you were saying, like these two levels of reality being true, like everything mm -hmm. is perfect in this like grand opera of evolution. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And at the same time, like, oh my God, we're all gonna die. <laughs> um, climate change, is that real? Like we can't, we can't, all these things need to get fixed or could be improved upon, but it's, um, it is being able to hold that paradox within myself that allows me to be more effective at whatever pursuits I take on in, um, in interacting with, uh, the world around me and the visions that I receive and the ideas that I have and the messages I would like to convey to others in a way that they might believe they are true. You know, mm -hmm. all of these, all of these things to do it in a way where it's like, it's not, but it's not uh, driven by it, you know? Yeah. 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 It's like, it's like this, this spiritual realization is first working. By the way, people can ask questions anytime. Um, Christina says, maybe it's by peeling out the outer layers that we find our true selves. That's, I like that phrasing of that. But yeah, you can ask questions, join in anytime. time, comments. Um, yeah, everything is like perfect as it is. It's like just spiritualization. And yet like we're creative people, you know, we're like, we're, we have such, cre we, there's this creative energy inside us that wants to create, um, 
something more beautiful, you know? So that's kind of how I feel it now on myself. It's like, I'm not, it's not because like, oh, we're all going to die. The world's going to end. I mean, obviously the world's going to end at some point, even if a meteor hits it or something. But from a spiritual realization, it's like, well, I, I realized that which transcends birth and death. And like, there's this impulse, like perhaps even greater from a deeper level, from like a, a source level to create in this world, you know, to create. It's like we're the hand, we're the, um, there's an uh, author who said once, we're the hands of God, right? We're the hands of spirit, this intelligence to create in this world. So the, the creation comes through us. And to me, it's like when we open ourselves, we become available for that, which like you're, you're doing that now with the book and the speaking and the coming out um, to different places and offering what you have to share. And I'm doing that. Um, it's like, it's the greatest natural high. It's like, oh, like this is why I'm here. Like this is what I'm here for, right? So I feel like in the beginning of your journey, there was kind of like this search for meaning and purpose. And a lot of the people that you were um, connected with or talking with or friends with, there was a similar thing. And maybe it was sort of like a um, kind of a self-absorption a bit, you know, right? Like looking for how to find happiness a little bit. And then there's like some kind of shift of like, oh, actually, like if I'm being of service to the world and, and using my highest created potential to be a service to the world, that's the greatest natural high that there is. That's what I feel like the journey that you've, you've been on is pointing at. Yeah, and I'll agree with Christina as well that, you know, I think there's like a, there's a compulsion with a lot of millennials or just young people, but I think it's, uh, it's more, it's, the expression of it is, is more pronounced in this generation than other generations previously, mm -hmm. just some other factors of like finding yourself Mm -hmm. And people think like they're going to find themselves in Bali or they're going to find themselves. <laughs> I know. Right? It's so much more about uncovering the conditioning that has prevented you from just embodying your own essence. And this idea that we get to one of the greatest things we get to manifest as the hands of God are, is ourselves and our own self-concept. And someone just told to me today, he's like, Allison, what if we're here to create or manifest everything that we have ever desired? And when we find like when nothing in the world has that, we have attachment to anything in the world and creating whatever experience to the world, like we're done. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, it is through this manifestation and it is through this incredible capacity that humans have to alter our environments in a way that no other species in this planet uh, has like the mind and the capability to do, which is why I think that we have become the dominant species on this planet that, um, that, yeah, like what else are we going to do while we're here? Pick our nose. You know, that's not like, that doesn't really bring Only contentment either. Traffic. That's yes. we do we well, can listen to audiobooks like <laughs> buy my book on audiobook i have an audiobook so so yeah and i think that's another thing i noticed with my peers is like there's some kind of canyon between searching and trying to find yourself and then having ideas like brilliant ideas i think millennials are incredibly intelligent and visionary and creative Sorry, are we here? Okay, sorry, this phone. Yeah. Never get the Google phone. Um, mm -hmm. So there's sometimes this canyon between not being able to actually step into our manifesting power and This time, I'm not sure if you're here. You're, you're, you're froze talking about manifesting power and why we're here. And, what... and there was some kind of really wild, like disco lighting effect happening there that was like creating an ambiance for all of us to, to feel into and delve into. And um, 
Allison has like <laughs> gone, and I think she'll. I have my senses she'll reemerge in a couple of minutes. Meanwhile, we're here, and um, you guys can join in. Christina, any questions you have? Any comments you have? Anything you want to explore on this topic? It's it's just like this level of reaching into, tapping into um, the deepest level of meaning and purpose and inspiration, and you know, you start off looking for happiness in this kind of self-centered way, right? This kind of um, hedonistic self-centered way. Um, and then you start to realize that this, this greatest happiness comes just in the, in the opposite. It's like not thinking about yourself, not focusing on yourself, but focusing on the whole, focusing on the collective. And, and there's this energy that you get like, you know, it's like electric energy you get charged with, to get like inspired with, to get, you know, um, that imbues you and fills you. And um, uh, brings you into being. Let's see if I can bring you back on. Uh, you don't have uh, somehow your camera is not available, Allison. Add there we go. Yes. So that's that. That's that high that we're like we're talking about that we're tuning into. You know, that's great to hear, Sarah. Sarah says this topic resonates so much with my own experiences all right you're back i'm back yeah. this phone is kind of a lemon um yeah so i don't know where i was at with that but uh yeah just just that i if i could say one thing it's that i feel so much more so much better about myself now that i'm actually doing things that feel super on purpose right that's what stuck to me that's what struck out to me about what you're talking about when you were in the hippie phase so you're like you know, like, oh, I, you know, this is about connectivity and this is, I resonate with this also, right? So this is about connectivity. It's about like community. It's about like we're all in this together, you know, being beyond separation. And there's something like, and, and being open hearted and it, there's something really beautiful about being in those spaces. And then there's like something missing too, right? It's like, and we need to like, be on purpose and be creating something and making things happen. And, and, and so it's like, again, it's like this integration I find it's like that community has like a part of, they have like a piece of the pie, you know, but then there's this other part that like maybe the lawyer has a piece of that pie, you know, and you bring the two together and you have some kind of like wild, like, I don't know, some kind of wild mystic hippie lawyer. And like that, that's like, you know, there's something that you're working on all levels, you know? Um, so I just finding that like, that that's that yes there's like this sense of being and grounding in the being and then there's the doing right and the doing without grounding in the being is no good and the being with 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 the denial of doing is no good either so i found like on your journey it was like the integration of these these things together as one absolutely so one of the things that i saw too when i look at like your chapter on um, relationships and, and sexuality is I think that what we're opening to is like the core of it is really about authenticity and like living authentically and not being in some cookie, but cookie cutter thing of how it's supposed to be of how, you know, the conditioning of what you think it's supposed to be, but really like living our truths and living from a deeper place of our truths. And it feels like there's certainly been a huge opening in the last like decade or so with, um, gay liberation and, and lesbian couples and homosexual couples and gay marriage and opening up and just being able to, for people to be able to live a lifestyle that's authentic to them. It feels like where we're at, you know, and you talk about exploration of polyamorous relationships of having more than one lover and monogamous relationships. And I just see like, what I see is not like, Oh, it's going to be from this to this is going to be from this to all of this. You know, and people just really being able to tune into like living what's what's true and what's authentic and communicate um, moment by moment. And um, I think we lost you again. But then the other part that Allison talks about is this NVC, nonviolent communication. So being able to communicate honestly um, and sharing your feelings and sharing your needs moment by moment. Um, is like this other level of relating and the, the, the two of those things together of like being an authentic, um, being honest and being able to tune in to what your feelings and your needs are and communicate that 
with the people in your life is um, kind of the next level of where it's at is where I, is where I see us opening to. And that takes a greater level of self-awareness, right? That takes a greater level of where does self-awareness come from? Self-awareness comes from being present. Self-awareness comes from when we're present. There's this greater self-awareness to be in touch with our authentic self and who we are and what's alive and what's true for us in each moment, moment by moment and communicating that with uh, the people that we are relating with. I'm adding you back, Allison. See if you can connect through. So that's what I see in the level of relationship and also what I see on the level of self-awareness, right? So being able to live this, just in this authentic level of truth and this level of like really noticing this is what I'm feeling right now. Because what you, were, what you felt or thought or believed, you know, a month ago or a year ago, we're in a times where things are shifting and moving so quickly in the evolution of our consciousness that you got to tune into what's alive in here in the moment. What's here in the moment. So I'm adding you, Allison. I don't know if somehow it's not um, connecting. But uh, I see you here. Welcome, Karen. Thanks for being here. And also this sense of realizing that we're creating, we're a part of creating. You didn't get it yet. Hmm. It says it's adding you. I'm not sure why you're not getting it. It says you're being added. Let's just try one more time. It's also a good moment if anyone has any questions or comments. Jump in. Feel free to share what's alive for you, what's, what you're noticing, what you're thinking. What you're, what's moving to you, what's feeling alive for you. Um. <laughs> Allison says, the conversation is so hot, my phone is overheating. Yeah, I can't add you. I don't know why, but it's saying adding and then nothing's, nothing's happening. But maybe you could chime in, like just add some comments down there and write some things and I can share what you're saying and what, what's alive and what you want to share that way until we uh, get you back in. What I noticed too is this sense of how things are quickening and how they're moving faster and how there's, um, th there's, what we, there's, there's a sense of where like say my grandparents' generation where things were like kind of slow and um, you know, people kind of stayed in the same town, had the same job, had the same relationship, and the kids grew up, and they stayed in the same town, had the same welcome pack, had the same relationship as a family. Now we're in a time where things move so quickly with the movement of the internet and texting and social media, and um, there's the ability to process so much more information in the span of a day than my grandparents, you know, could have in you know, five years potentially, right? So it just opens up this whole other level of, of, of living and relating and different dynamics and tools that we're working with. Allison's, yes, sometimes we have to stay and sometimes we have to go, but we can always come back if it remains a loving place. That is true. Yeah, and that there's this sense of like being to... Um, beyond our comfort zone, right? So I feel like that's something that you encountered um, quite a bit on your journey is like the sense of like, you know, this is what I'm familiar with, this is what I'm comfortable with, or what I have been, what I've been used to, and the ability to stretch yourself and to move into the unknown, to move into places that are unfamiliar to you, to move into spaces where you don't know exactly what's going to happen or how it's going to turn out. Like that is the essence of the evolution of consciousness. That's what evolution of consciousness is. You have to continually move into unknown territory. You have to continue to let go of the conditioning of the past and open to the future um, with the chance, with the risk of opening to a way that brings more insight, brings more inspiration, 
brings more revelation, brings more luminosity, brings more love, brings more inner peace, more freedom, brings more empowerment to the world, right? So we, we take that, we take that risk in the unknown to do that. And in doing that, we benefit the world. And I think that's really what we could say leadership, if we want to use that term, leadership is. Leadership is that realization, that opening to that, that space and that truth. Um, and it can feel scary, for sure. It can feel, there you are. Ah! You're here. Your phone must have, your phone must have cooled down. Um, I hope it doesn't heat up again. If I, it's perfectly in line though with this subject because if I have to leave, I promise to come back as long as right. this remains a loving space. Right. Right. You know. Right. Sometimes we just have to do. Um, sometimes it's just this idea. I think that like your purpose is going to uh, involve you walking beside the same person for your entire life. Uh, I think that's what the millennials are challenging. It's like, why can't we, we're now like experiencing more of this relationship anarchy. It's like, why can't we custom, custom make relationships based on whatever kind of uh, sacred contract we have with the hundreds of individuals that we're going to encounter over a lifetime who have some kind of, have some kind of spiritual expansion lesson for us. Right. You know, and I'm not, I'm not knocking that for some people you like, it might be like, I have my one beloved that I will say that I met in high school and I will die beside. Cause that's, that is so beautiful and profound in its own way too. And, um, and, you know, for some people, especially highly transformative people, it's not always realistic. Especially highly transformative people. That's a really important point because that's what I was saying earlier. Like the more you transform, the more you evolve, the more you're rapidly changing. And the more um, you are going to um, be encountering people that are, are, it's like, if I look at my life, right? It's like, I probably had like, you know, that saying like cats have nine lives, right? like there's a, you, you have like different lifetimes within this life in a way that wasn't the same before so it's like you're you're moving in these different phases evolution of conscious and you're going to be resonating at a different level and resonating with different people now it's totally possible that people can be evolving evolving with you right that's totally possible and it's totally possible that they might not be evolving with you so i that's where i say it's like just being authentic to what's true inside yourself and living to that truth from in yourself you know moment by moment yeah, and I think millennials are really experimenting with that. And I and I could also say on the shadow side of it, you know, sometimes there is this maybe avoidance around accountability and like the incredible amount of accountability it requires to build the life with a partner and to be like, okay, I can't just do whatever I want whenever I want all the time. And um, to deal with the reflections back of you of the of the character, you know, character deficits some of us all have, right? And that relationship really is this crucible to fine tune our ability to work in concert with another human being. And of course, compatibility plays a huge part of it. But it's also, it's also, you know, one of the greatest the greatest grounds for our spiritual maturation. And it's easy sometimes to disguise in this crazy culture of tinder and we're almost like uh, mass consuming people online and it's like nope not her not her not her and you know maybe we have to like be the one before we can find the one and uh, but part of that is hugely about knowing yourself enough to know enough to know Enough to be able to like stand in that space in a good way, in like a truly good way. And marriage, I think, for millennials is not about capitalism or, you know, we're not getting arranged marriage. It's not about like, I have nine goats. Like, you want to get married, babe? Um, you know, it's like, and, and, you know, for a lot of the world, it's still like that. And because, yeah. because these capitalist, you know, like these capitalist notions of what marriage is, all like is and then also like it's not this you're not going to be like ostracized from society if you stay single anymore i think it's becoming more socially normative to crusade these other different paths i think millennials are really 
experimenting with what is the spiritual meaning of marriage and partnership and what are the many different expressions of that and how what can that look what can that look like but i will say that if you really welcome deborah if you really really do something else you're froze you're froze i think maybe Maybe you're not here. Um, but I like what she's talking about as far as um, tuning into what's, what's true and finding the, finding the way that works for you, finding the, 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 the resonance, the frequency that works for you. And that's really true across the board. And that's what I see. If I see something that's like exciting to me about where we're at, uh, what's possible for us, that's what I see that's exciting. You know, is this ability to be deeper level of presence, deeper level of self-awareness, deeper level of then authenticity and intimacy with the truth of who I am and the unique expression of who I am and the unique desires and needs that I have and then they're able to express it in the world. And that's what feels most exciting to me and the potential that we have. And I think the message that's here. Hey there. Can you hear me? Yep, back again. Okay. This has got to be the most interesting episode you've ever formed. The most interesting episode ever, <laughs> ever, ever, for sure. It's all about uh, goodbyes. It's all about hellos and goodbyes. Yeah, Just rolling with it, right? Rolling with it. Rolling with what arises. Yep. But, Wonderful. Um, we're, nearing the, we're nearing the end of your time, so why don't you just share, like, kind of um, – you know, it's kind of summarizing what, what the book means to you and like, you know, what it's meant to you and sharing it and also where people can get it and kind of what you're doing now. Yeah. So the book for me, it's like my magnum opus. It's my theory of everything through the eyes of the rising generation. It's everything I had to learn the hard way that they didn't teach me in school um, anyone who feels lost and is young, I hope it becomes something that comforts you and perhaps um, lets you know you're not alone and also provides you with provides you with some inspiration. Pardon. Yes, there we go. Inspiration. And you can find it on Amazon. You can find it in Barnes and Noble across the country. You can find it in independent booksellers like Boulder. And, and that's all, folks. Thank you so much. And I'm sorry for all the technical delays. I hope you still got some good juicy nuggets of useful information and some entertainment. And thank you so much, Brian. Thank you so much, Allison. And so everyone knows this will be available also on the replay. Most of you watching the replay. So you'll see it here on Facebook Live, on YouTube, on SoundCloud, iTunes, and my website and other good places uh, from here, from now, forever, eternally. So, yeah, thanks so much, Allison. Allison's book, Millennial's Guide to Changing the World. Pick it up and enjoy it like I did. Bye, Allison. <laughs> And uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you all for hanging in as we had our as we had our uh, our technical ins and outs today. Um, there's something like really something really um, special to me about coming on Facebook Live. Like I don't know anyone else really does it like this. So just being able to come on and just whatever happens happens, and and having that kind of rawness that I think is just um, really an alternative to the kind of over-edited, over-polished stuff that we get nowadays where there's this kind of presentation of how it's supposed to be or how it's supposed to look or, you know, as opposed to here, it's like, it's almost like, um, you know, some kind of, uh, there's a term for it when art where you just kind of come out and then whatever happens, happens, you know, this this improvisational like this is what happened in this moment in time from like 
you know, 1 p.m. Eastern to 2 p.m. Eastern on, on Thursday, November 8th, this is what happened, right? And it's like, we're not going to edit it. We're not going to, we're not going to, we're not going to repolish or frame it. So there's something beautiful about that. There's something that can be nice about a really well edited film, you know, something that's really structured in a way that presents itself in a certain way. There's beauty to everything, as we talked about earlier. But there is something uh, I find beautiful about um, what we're doing here. And maybe we'll do it other ways in the future. Um, share your feedback, share your thoughts, share your, your questions, share your comments about the episode today. Share um, what you'd like to see in the future if you have suggestions for guests. There's um, some links below for me to plug in deeper in what I have happening, what I have going on. And uh, I wish you all a beautiful rest of your day. And uh, see you in the next now. In fact, before we go, let's just take a moment to take a breath together. Just have a moment of silent stillness and presence together. Thank you all so much. See you in the next now.